you were to ask the question, who is the most annoying person in history? You'd get some interesting answers. I know this because I asked the question in our little text group uh, over the last 24 hours, and I got some pretty good answers. Some of them are funny, some of them are not. Uh, From Bill, I got a guy we used to work with that I actually liked, um, but he could be annoying. And no, for those of you who were part of the show, it was not Mazzy. Um, one of the other answers I got was Eve, you know, Adam and Eve, because everything went downhill after she did what she did. But it actually is remarkable that there is an answer to the question, who is the most annoying person in history? It's an answer that comes from a surprising place. Well, history, of course, but we've got to go back a long, long way to find it. The great painting that Michelangelo, or I'm sorry, Raphael did, why I said Michelangelo, Raphael did at the Sistine Chapel, my favorite painting, really, in, in all of mid uh, of Renaissance art, is this, this painting of, called The School of Athens. And in this painting are numerous figures, the central of which there is Plato, who is famous for his Republic, Plato's Republic. His hand's always in the air like that. And it's really Plato that we're going to be dealing with here in in a lot of ways, although he is not the most annoying person. The The most annoying person in all of history is Plato's mentor or inspiration. And he's actually featured in this painting. If you happen to be looking at a picture of the painting or the painting itself, if you happen to find yourself in the Sistine Chapel right now, he is a few characters to the right of Plato or the left of the painting as you're looking at it. And he's very prominent in that second line of people. You'll see him there in a greenish brownish robe. And he appears to be talking to multiple people all of whom appear to be less than enamored listening to him. He's got his hands kind of held out, and he's pointing his fingers as if to say, this point, this point, this point. And that, my friends, is Socrates. Yes, Socrates, the man who is the most annoying person in all of history, is Socrates. And why do we say that? Well, it's kind of funny, really. It's a thing called the Olympus, which is what he's portrayed doing there in that painting, the School of Athens. He is refuting or challenging, or I guess you could say the, the word really translates as refutation. It's a refutation of an answer that he has been given. And this is what Socrates does. He asks a question. It's called a what is question. So he might ask, what is beauty? What is love? What is chocolate ice cream? What is justice? And he will wait then for an answer. And then he will proceed to explain to you, whoever you are giving giving him your answer, why you're wrong. Which is, you know, one of those things that people hate. People hate being told why they're wrong, especially when they've put something into their, some thought into their answers, which of course the people who Socrates is dealing with have done, particularly when Plato writes him uh, in the Republic, you know, this isn't, these aren't simple conversations. These aren't, Hey, you're, you know, what is chocolate ice cream? Well, it's ice cream that tastes like banana. Well, you're an idiot. Here's my Elenchus, you're my refutation. Here's why you're stupid. We're talking about deep philosophical questions. And every time someone answers one of these questions, Socrates explains to them why they are wrong. And believe me, people hate being told that they're wrong, especially when they put thought into something. There is no doubt in my mind that part of that annoyance is probably what contributes to the willingness of the city of Athens later to execute, or in modern terms, cancel Socrates. Yeah, I know there's a lot of other stuff going on at the same time, 
but I'm pretty sure that people who might have otherwise stood up and spoken for Socrates probably looked at it and said, mm, you know what, that guy's just annoying. He's the most annoying man in all of history. 2,500 years from now, people are going to be talking about how annoying he is because he's still annoying. But what he did do was he influenced Plato. And Plato would go on to write his book, The Republic, which has become the manuscript that, well, has influenced a lot of things, hasn't it? In The Republic, Plato theorizes a conversation from Socrates explaining the perfect city-state, the perfect Republican-type government, and how that should work, or at least how it could work, or at least how it might work, maybe, if we, if we all did it right. And this book, of course, has gone down into history to the point where even I have a copy of it today, because it is A, a very remarkable book, and B, it is a learning experience all brought on because Socrates was annoying people with his elenchuses. I don't, if, if that's plural, I don't, I don't speak Greek, so I don't know what the plural of elenchus would be. But his refutations of, of questions are contained in these, these books, particularly the Republic. And that is what actually leads to, well, one of the more annoying things that's going to happen in 1787 and 1788. The convention finished in September, September 17th, you know this, and less than a month later, after all this is done, right, the convention is done, Washington is, he's not 100% satisfied with this, but he's mostly satisfied with it. He, we did our best. It's not perfect. There are some things I would like to see differently, but can't have, we can't get everything in there, and you know, it was a miracle that we managed to get this much. There's a famous story of a woman walking by and Ben Franklin is there and she says to him, Mr. Franklin, what kind of government have you given us? And you know the quote, right? I mean, you could probably say it with me. A republic, madam, if you can keep it. And this has come down to us today as being the defining element of a lot of our political belief, hasn't it? Number one, it's why we believe we have a republic. And number two, because Franklin says that's what he gave you. We gave you a republic, if you can keep it. And number two, it has also become a, a firm belief in our mind that we have some level of responsibility towards keeping it and that a failure to do so is, well, that's the reason for why we struggle, right? Brutus, the anti-federalist that we've been talking about, has had exactly a month to peruse the proposed Constitution. And he has spent a month going through it, reading it, trying to comprehend it. Can you imagine? I mean, today, people read the Constitution and... How much of it do they really grasp? Now, I've said this for years. I don't believe, I, I get mad when people start talking about constitutional scholars. There's no such thing. The Constitution wasn't written, as Captain Kirk said, for kings and princes and lawyers and that kind of thing. It was written for every day. It was written in the common language of the every man of that day. And yet today people read it and sometimes we don't understand it. I got to be honest with you, in doing the study for this particular episode, I discovered parts of the Constitution that I thought I understood. I re I've read them hundreds of times. But when a different potential translation or different poten potential interpretation of that was pointed out to me, it was like, wait a minute. Wait a Maybe it does mean that kind of approach to things. Can you imagine trying to read this for the first time? Because, and here's the important part. Nothing like this had ever been done before. You have to understand that this constitution, the, the proposed constitution in 1787, the constitution that today we take as 
the example of what a Republican government is supposed to be because it says right in there, we guarantee a Republican form of government for every state. And because Ben Franklin said, it's a republic, madam, if you can keep it. This is the definition of republic to us. But in 1787, in October of 1787, this was not the definition of republic. In fact, this was a radical, almost unthinkable departure from the ideas of republican government. And on October 18th, 1787, the first of Brutus's letters will appear in the papers of New York. And there are many things we're going to talk about in here. Um, but perhaps the most famous quote from that letter is simply this. But remember, when the people once part with power, they can seldom or never resume it again, but by force. Many instances can be produced in which people have voluntarily increased the powers of their rulers, but few, if any, in which rulers have willingly abridged their authority. This is a sufficient reason to induce you to be careful in the first instance how you deposit the powers of government. And it's really here that Brutus is going to start with this concept of why do we need this new constitution? Well, you get it. There's some problems with the Confederation, the Articles of Confederation. We, we understand that. But some of the other Federalists will point out that those problems, anti-Federalists, sorry, will point out that those aren't, those aren't problems with the design of the government. They're problems with the virtues of the people. The people are not being... Republican enough. So when, when, when the Confederation runs into problems, it's not really the government's fault. We're too quick to blame the government instead of ourselves, as, as one of them will say. Brutus is deeply concerned, and he is questioning why. And in his first letter, he's going to lay out a lot of those concerns that he has. Number one, you don't give power to people because they don't give it back. And if you give it to them, you better be dang sure that they're going to do it right. Because if they don't, you ain't going to get it back, except by rebellion. And he goes on to talk about in his first letter, this that's being proposed does not meet the definition of classical republicanism. This is not what we are. And we are a republic right now. We have 13 states confederated under a central government to which we give some limited powers. But this, well, this is so much more. Ben Franklin says it's a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Well, what is meant here? In 1787, the word republic. To us today, it means the Constitution. We just accept that. We today say, this is a republic. It was a representative republic. It's, we're not a democracy. How many times have I said that on the air? How many times have you said that to someone who says, you know, we should be a democracy? You've said, no, we're a republic. Because we've all done it. Today, we define republic in constitutional terms. In fact, if you go look in the dictionary, because I've done it, You'll find that in the past 40 years or so, the dictionary definition of republic has changed to a representative republic of the people where the people's rep power is vested in their representatives. Go look it up yourself. You don't need me to do it. Let's get a very old dictionary from 100 years ago and then get one from today. You'll see what I'm talking about. But that wasn't the understanding of republicanism in 1787. Now. It would be easy to point out that republicanism, republicanism in 1787 was understood by Greco-Roman terms, but Plato's Republic and the outline and the other, uh, the other folks, Cicero, uh, some of the other antiquities, historians and philosophers who came up with these ideas of what was a republic left some 
left some things to be desired, especially, especially Socrates, but we'll get into that at some point, I'm sure. But if you were to say, okay, what are the general characteristics of a classical republic? Now, again, we could spend days talking about this. In fact, I've spent the last week and roughly $350 studying exactly that. We're not going to do that here. We're just going to give you the general characteristics. Number one is it is run by a natural aristocracy, which is landowner based. The the inherited landowner. It is a natural aristocracy. This is actually uh, what, what Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, would later write. Those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. If he ever had a chosen people, whose breasts he has made for his particular deposit for substantial and genuine virtue. It is the focus in which he keeps alive that sacred fire, which otherwise might escape from the face of the earth. Corruption of morals in the mass mass of cultivators, farmers, is a phenomenon of which no age nor nation has ever furnished an example. Now, I think that's a little flowery for, which is typical of Jefferson, but in essence, what he's saying is this natural aristocracy, that's, the, that's actually his term. He will use that later on in a letter to Jefferson, he, or I'm sorry, to Adams. He's very okay with a natural aristocracy, and he defines that as people who are particularly able to lead others, natural-born leaders, natural-born politicians, natural-born people who will always put the betterment of whatever they're dealing with first. He's also very concerned about a, a fake or a malignant aristocracy. We'll talk about that at some point in the future. Secondly, the general characteristic of a classical republic, a Greco-Roman republic, is that it promotes civic and personal virtue. And it defines that as being as what's in the best interest of the community as a whole. Now, that doesn't sound very libertarian, does it? A libertarian republican today is going to be about individualism. But the Greco-Roman definition is different than that, in that personal and civic virtues are what's best for the community, particularly, and I don't have time to go into the whole thing, but particularly in the area of religion. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a, kind of an interesting thing, which is of course the whole deal with, with Plato's Republic. Socrates has gone down uh, to the, to the docks because he, he's, he's heard about a new God and he wants to go see what's going on. The real politic of a general characteristic of a classical republic, though, is that it forces power sharing. The leaders, as I said, are agrarian, agrarian based. They have inherited wealth, but they are not servants of the people, but they are servants of the civic virtue. You follow the difference there? It's never intended that in this republic, in this Greco Roman republic, that the leadership, the natural aristocracy, be servants of the people. They're servants of the virtue, which isn't the same thing. But the real politic is, and, and they all recognize this, Plato recognizes it, Socrates recognizes it, the, the Roman writers recognize it, is that there is a real politic that deals with commercial interests. And so they are forced to share power. They are forced to form a, a, an interdependent type relationship in which that is shared with the natural aristocracy. Now, does that sound like a republic to you? That, that you've been told from your high school days what a republic is? Does, does that sound? See, what we've been told is these, these Greco-Roman republics were democracies. And they were. The, the idea, though, was that the only real democracy was the natural aristocracy forced to share some of its power with the commercial interests. Is that for the betterment of civic virtue? I don't know. The, in the 1740s, though, came a new idea. It's actually an old idea, reinterpreted under a more modern idea. 
A guy by the name of Montesquieu, you've probably heard of him. Montesquieu is a very famous French philosopher of the Enlightenment. Thus, he is very well known to the men who wrote the Declaration of Independence, who wrote the Constitution, and in the framing and founding generations of our country, it is Montesquieu's ideas that most take hold. And he has reinterpreted the Greco-Roman Republic in, in some different ways. Number one, he has redefined virtue. Virtue is no longer what is best for the community. So whether that's building a temple or worshiping a certain god, he has redefined it as the love of democracy or virtue is that of equality. He believes in equality of all of the citizens. Now, before you get really excited, we don't have time to get into it today, but he does have a slightly different definition of equality than you or I do today. Much like Socrates, he does not hold that diversity, cultural diversity in a republic is a good thing. But we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. He says things like this, the republic is the regime where the people as a body, or only some of the people, are the sovereign power. So he's kind of okay with the idea of representative government, but he ultimately believes that it should be the people that hold the power, democracy. And he points out that political liberty in a citizen is that peace of mind that comes with the opinion or comes from the opinion each person has of his safety. And to have this liberty, the government must be such that no citizen can be afraid of another. Now, this is more the understanding that Brutus, the Anti-Federalists, and even the Federalists have of what is a republic in 1787. It, is very it does have a much more democratic approach to it than the Greco-Roman republics, in the sense that the people are the ultimate power. And while it can be representative, it's, it's you know, there is, a, there is a, um, an element to it that is important because it, 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 it restrains government power. And remember that when Montesquieu wrote his book in the 1740s, we had come through hundreds of years of absolutism with the kings believing that they had the divine right and still believing that, by the way, in France when he wrote this book, which is why it was so controversial. It was immediately translated into English. And by the 1750s and the early 1760s, literally every American in the country had either read it for themselves or had it read to them and understood, at least in principle, the Montesquieuian ideas of republicanism. Now, I said this before, and I will say it again. Montesquieu, much like Socrates, has some ideas that sound foreign to us when it comes to republic and what it should be. Number one, and perhaps one of the biggest points that, that Brutus is going to make and the Anti-Federalists are going to make, is he believes that republics must be small. They must be contained. They must be small enough that everyone in that republic knows the people that are standing for office. And he or she, as the case may be later on, knows all of his constituents or her constituents. And one of Brutus's complaints, many of the other Federalists complain the same, is that in a republic that covers millions upon millions of square miles of the East Coast of the North American continent, that's simply not possible. And because it's not possible that the people would know their representatives, it's going to lead to problems. Hamilton is going to take this on. And later on in Federalist number nine, he is going to eviscerate Greco-Roman and even Montesquieuian republics, which is the first indicator we have that the Federalists will acknowledge the fact that what they are proposing is, in fact, not a republic, at least not in the sense that most Americans understand it. He will say it is impossible to read the history of the petty republics of Greece and Italy, Rome, 
without feeling sensations of horror and disgust at the distractions with which they were continually agitated, and at the rapid succession of rep revolutions by which they were kept in a constant state of perpetual vibration between the extremes of tyranny and anarchy. That's Hamilton's response to some of what Brutus is saying uh, with regards to this. It is understood by us. Franklin's response. What, what kind of government have you given us? A republic, madam, if you can keep it. And this is, I would say, where our modern understanding of a republic really begins. Because to that point, the Constitution, as proposed in 1787, would not have been understood as a republic. Nor did the Federalists acknowledge that it was a republic. In fact, they make it very clear that this is a radical departure from not just Greco-Roman history, but from Montesquieu as well. And they will make arguments in multiple papers as to why it's important to depart from those interpretations. Because clearly those, those republics don't work. Clearly those republics are problematic. And in order to avoid the problems, errors, mistakes, difficulties of those types of republics, we have to, like Montesquieu did, redefine what republic means. And we have to make it work in an American way. In some ways, if I can go back a few shows and talk about something we've talked about on Plausibly Live before, a pursuit of happiness, a different way of thinking. Rather than thinking, I think, therefore I am, thinking instead, I think, I perceive, and I act, therefore I am. And on a national, national level, seeing that much differently. Brutus is still very concerned by this. And he starts his letter, and I'm, I'm not going to read the whole letter to you. It's available to you. But there's some things here that you need to understand that he is going to start asking. Now, remember where we started all this with being annoying. The, the Federalists, the Constitutionalists, the men who worked and signed the Constitution worked very hard. They worked very diligently. They worked very long. The better part of five months in Philadelphia, in the heat of the summer, in a closed room with Luther Martin over there in the corner, drunk and talking real loud and smelly, they put a lot of work and effort into this. And before anybody can really even start talking about whether we're going to approve it or not, here's Brutus in the newspapers going, hey, wait a minute. This is wrong doing the Socratean finger pointing at his hand. This is, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. Can you imagine how annoying that would be? And in fact, you can get some of that, particularly in Federalist 9, which Hamilton writes, you get a lot of sense of that, you know, bleep this guy. Brutus starts this whole thing with this question, why? This, this what is question that Socrates would have asked. Why do we need a federal government? Why do we need a government? Why do we need a federal government that the Federalists admit is not a republic? And he says these very words. The first question that presents itself on the subject is whether a confederated government be best for the United States or not. What is best for the United States? Civic virtue. Or in other words, whether the 13 United States should be reduced to one great republic governed by one legislature under the direction of one executive and one judicial, or whether they should continue 13 confederated republics under the direction and control of a supreme federal head for certain defined national purposes only. So already, he's saying this national government as proposed is problematic because, well, this inquiry is important, he says, because although the government reported by the convention, presented the, the proposed constitution, does not go to a perfect and entire consolidation, yet it approaches so near to it, 
listen to this, that it must, if executed, if the Constitution is adopted, certainly and infallibly, infallibly terminate in it. It will eventually become a central government which will subsume the states. And by way of example, he goes into a diatribe about the power of taxing. You're giving this government the power of taxing. And with the rather vague way some of these things are written, you know, necessarily welfare, those kinds of clauses in there, it's not very clear where this begins and ends. Uh, obviously, it begins where we give you the power, but who knows where it ends up. And eventually, you're going to have a state a federal government that can overrule the states on every level, simply on the basis of taxes, simply on the basis of money. There are a lot of areas that we're going to see Brutus does not agree with Hamilton on. We'll see some of those in the next episode. As I said, Hamilton is going to shoot back in a few weeks with, with, with Federalist number 9. And he's going to explain why Montesquieuian republics are failures and why they can't work. And, and you're so wrong. He's going to elunkus him. He's going to repudiate him. You are so wrong. His fingers pointing into his hands. Before anybody has even started state conventions. Already Publius, Hamilton, and Brutus, probably Melanchthon Smith are annoying each other. And they are already trying to out-Socrates the other. You are wrong. This argument is going to get brutal. It's going to get personal. It's going to get flat-out mean. You saw some of what Hamilton is going to say about history and people who pay attention to history. But, dot, 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 this argument is also remarkable because it's civilized. The language never deviates from the proffer. It might be mean, it might be direct, but it never drifts into the obscene or the vulgar. There is other differences between today and then as well in this argument. There is, of course, no social media. And so no 140 character zingers to get each other. Every one of these letters is hundreds of words in, it in length. They're all over the place. There are no, there's no broadcast media at all. There's, there's none of that. This is kind of, um, well, it's good, obviously, because can you imagine, just, just take my job. Can you, t can, can you imagine talk radio in 1787 and 1788? Now, the truth is that I have actually toyed with the idea of a, of a podcast that is set in that era. So, uh, I, I, Radio Norwich, Norwich, Connecticut. And the idea here is that, obviously, we'd have to have people playing roles. But to do talk radio, modern talk radio, with modern language, not speaking like they would have, but modern talk language in 1787 and, and debate the Federalist Papers and the anti-federalist position in 1787 on radio. Can you imagine what that was? Can you imagine the callers as much as I hate callers? Can you imagine them in 1788? Oh my gosh. I want to do it for uh, pre-revolutionary war too. That would be, be fun. There's no sound bites. There's no 140 characters. There's none of that. There's no social media at all. There's no broadcast media. The only thing there is, is newspapers and broadsides. And these set no limits. There are no limits whatsoever on the number of words that can be used. There are, there are, uh, of course, letters to the editor that are going to be sent. People are going to write letters to the editor. Dear editor, dear friends, signed an anti-federalist, signed a federalist, signed a federal farmer. And you're dealing with a very literate society. People who are well steeped in language. They understand it. They read it. They write it. And even those who can't read and write are having it read to them and dictating their thoughts back. And 
you're dealing with people who know all of this history. Publius and Brutus are well known to them in history, as are the Greco-Roman writers, as is Socrates, as is Plato, and especially Montesquieu. They know all of this. They know all of this history. They know what a republic is, and they know that what they're being shown here, while it might be innovative, unique, and really cool, is not a republic, at least not as they understand it. And they will begin to annoy each other, and they will begin to point fingers, and they will get, yes, violent. There will be fights. There will be moments where this debate gets out of hand. July 4th, 1788, in Rhode Island, Providence. The governor orders the militia out to, if need be, shoot Federalists who are having a 4th of July barbecue. And of course, it causes people to do things that perhaps they wouldn't normally do. A well-known Federalist in Pennsylvania who takes anti-Federalist pamphlets and writings that he's been given to distribute for the debate. He says... Those are too good. Um, better hide these so nobody can read them. Those kinds of things are going to end up happening. But in all of this, the form and the process of Socratic debate, Platonian debate, Roman debate, all, and, and even Montesquieu to some degree, are still there. They're still clear and precise, and they're on full display in this entire debate between Brutus and Publius, as well as the other Federalists. Just, when I say Brutus, just assume I mean all of them, although we're focusing on Brutus. So what is our first lesson? I told you we were going to look at this from a what can we learn from this? What is the first lesson from Brutus and the Anti-Federalists straight out of Brutus 1? I think it's this. Debate is a process that is going to annoy everyone. No one likes being told you're wrong. No one likes that. And you don't like it when somebody comes back at you. No, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. No, you, no, you, nobody likes that. But if you maintain it as a debate process, point by point, rather than taking it personally, progress can be made or maybe it can't, but at least it's civil. It's not 140 characters. Now, will that work in today's world? Can you have a Socratic debate over the virtues of, of a form of government? Can you have a platonic debate over whether or not the government has in fact, <laughs> what, how, did he, how did he word that? Uh, did the, uh, sorry. <laughs> Certainly and infallibly terminated in a government that has subsumed the states? Can we have that debate without getting personal, without getting mad, without getting finger pointy? And can we do it in 140 characters? I don't know. Maybe the first lesson of all this is we need to figure out a way to adopt that debate style, the Socratic debate style, the Federalist and Anti-Federalist debate style to our modern era, our modern social media, and our modern broadcast media. Because until we can discuss these things intelligently, as Brutus and Publius do, all we're going to be doing is yelling at each other, and that's going to leave us as the most annoying persons in history. Mm-hmm.